Great. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, it's only the second time I've ever been here. Um, when I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, just north of here, and uh, when I was in high school, I used to play a lot of chess. And one of the defining moments of my life, because really chess is how I sort of learned to think. I mean, that's how I sort of you know, became a scientist by studying chess as a kid because I was bored in high school and whatever. But anyway, I, in chess, when I was studying playing chess, I came down to the University of Chicago when I was like 15 years old and stayed in the dorm and uh, played in this chess tournament. And it was like one of the most amazing experiences of my life because I just you know, live in rural Wisconsin. And this was the only time I've ever been to a really academic institution. So uh, anyway, so I have very fond memories of it, although I don't remember any of the details. <laughs> All I can remember were these old buildings with these twisty passages. But, so it's really great to come back. This was like 30 years later and, and actually see the place that I was so impressed with. Um, so, anyways, uh, I want to talk to you about some research I've been doing at Stanford um, as part of the, what we call the Pervasive Parallelism Lab, uh, which is a laboratory revolving around uh, modern parallel computing and the fact that it's becoming uh, pervasive. That is, all of our devices are becoming parallel, okay? And uh, I just want to sort of give you, uh, it's a little bit high level, but I want to sort of give you our thinking on this problem and then tell you a little bit about specific results. But I think the, the way we're thinking about it is sort of interesting. I put this talk together about a year ago, and it's actually one of the more controversial talks I've given. Some people have very strong feelings about this, both for and against it. So if you have strong feelings, interrupt me at any time. I'm happy to take some tangents, okay? So, so one of the big issues in computing right now is that uh, we're becoming power constrained, right? Um, so you see this in mobile devices where you have these batteries and they don't last very long, right? So you know people like mobile devices if they could last all day or a couple days, and so if we our batteries run out, um, you know we're we don't we're not happy with them. And at the same time, at the level of supercomputers or high performance computing, as you probably know. Uh, the ability to build large machines is limited by the amount of power we have. So, you know, there's good reason that uh, some of the biggest computers in the world are being built at places like Oak Ridge is because they have a lot of power there. You know, data centers are being built on the Columbia River because uh, they have a lot of power there. And in fact, if you've been following what's going on in the government, they're about to launch this large exascale uh, computing program. And this is a plot of uh, various machines that the D Department of Energy has uh, deployed over the years since sort of then they really got involved in scientific simulation with ASCII Red. And what we're plotting is the gigaflops per watt. Okay, so you see we've made some progress in more efficiently uh, uh, building these machines. In other words, the gigaflops per watt has increased. And some of the more exotic machines, in particular Roadrunner, which uh, you may know is built on the cell processor in the PlayStation 3. Blue Gene, which is another custom processor, have all improved our power efficiency. But they, if you want to build an extreme scale or exascale machine, they expect, in order to make that practical, that by 2017 we'll have to be 100 times more power efficient. In other words, you'd have to be able to execute 100 times more flops uh, in the same uh, power budget. And really, nobody knows how to do this. Uh, and so this is what this research effort is to really make computing uh, more power efficient. And, you, and there's sort of, sort of two ways in general that I think people are exploring. One is special purpose hardware. So um, about a year ago, um, David Shaw, D.E. Shaw Research, uh, uh, published a paper on this machine called Anton that they had built. And it's a, really, it's a molecular dynamics computer. It can probably do, it can do the longest uh, sort of continuous time uh, uh, calculation of a, a protein folding. Uh, they they will do a millisecond on it. And basically, if you read the paper, they basically claim that this chip that they built is a hundred times more efficient than a general purpose computer. Okay, and I think this is widely believed that if you were to build any kind of custom hardware, it would be a hundred to a thousand times faster than a, a general processor if you know exactly one, if you have one calculation or one type of calculation. So this is one way of doing it is you build specialized hardware for it. Another way you generally do it is you specialize the architecture. So a couple years ago, I worked with Intel on this processor called Larrabee, which is a 32-core uh, uh, processor, each with a 16-wide SIMD unit. Uh, 
and it's optimized for throughput. That is, it's optimized for the total number of floating point operations per second that it can do, not the latency or the speed of, uh, of a single thread of execution. It assumes you have parallelism here. And at Intel, we did this study where we said that uh, we could have 20 times greater throughput, 20 times more floating point operations per second for the same area and power on this processor than you could on a traditional out of order processor like a Xeon processor like they were building. Now, all the details of this uh, don't matter, but basically the, the, the trick was to go to a really simple processor, in order processor, and to go to a very wide vector unit. And the combination of those uh, led to uh, this 20 fold increase in performance for the same. Our budget. Now, there was a cost to this in that you would have one half the sequential performance. Okay? In other words, if you just had a single thread of execution, it would run at half the speed. So instead of a three gigahertz processor, it would be like a one and a half gigahertz processor. So there was this trade off, right? If you know you have highly parallel code, you're 20 times more efficient than if you have sequential code. And I think this is. Uh, a, not quite the right number. This was published a year or two. You know, people have realized now that normal processors are so incredibly power inefficient that this is sort of an insane comparison. So if you were to actually build a more reasonable processor, maybe it would only be a factor of 10 or 8 or 10. But normal processors are really power inefficient. And so, uh, so maybe we shouldn't be even building those. And then, but you know, this is sort of why GPUs are such a big thing is because GPUs are about 10 times more power efficient than a CPU right now, if you've been following this, uh, at doing floating point uh, calculations. And therefore, a lot of those new machines, like the Blue Gene, is based on, on GPUs uh, because they deliver more flops. So, so any kind of specialization leads to efficiency. I mean, I think that sort of makes sense. Um, you know, I, I was trained as a biologist. I mean, organisms evolve to, you know, uh, adapt to their habitats or their environments. You know, there's no reason that computing systems couldn't be specialized in various ways and uh, perform uh, more efficiently. Um, but it also leads to heterogeneity, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, if you have, so let's say you were to accept my argument that CPUs are more efficient for sequential workloads. Like if you have a single thread of execution, they will uh, execute that, uh, uh, more quicker for the same power. But GPUs are more efficient for data parallel workloads. Well, let's say you have an algorithm or an application that requires both, right? Well, what you'd want to do is take, you don't want to run any inefficient code on the other processor, right? You always want to run the code that's best uh, for your processor. So the sequential code you'd run on the sequential processor, CPU, the data parallel code you'd run on the throughput processor. And then so the conclusion of that is the optimal platform would actually involve a mix of sequential cores and data parallel cores. So this is an argument made by Chuck Moore. I mean, other people have made the argument. He's given several keynotes on this. He's the CTO of AMD. But he just says, you know, if you have complex workloads, you're going to need a mix of processors if you want to use the machine in the optimal way. And so this is causing this idea that, you know, you can specialize things and then for complex workloads you have to have a variety of these things is leading to these what are called fusion processors, right? Everybody's heard about this. So Sandy Bridge from Intel, Bulldozer from AMD. Uh, and these processors, you know, we can, you know, we don't know the specs, but in the next couple of years we'll be having all these processors with maybe two to eight CPU cores, maybe 16 to 64 GPU cores, and a bunch of other hardware for different types of operations like video compression. And, 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 and in some sense, the future is already here. Because if you look at what everybody is shipping in a uh, smartphone, like the iPhone, is they're already shipping these fusion processors. So the sort of the hot chip of the year this year is this Apple A4 processor. It's a combination of a CPU and a GPU and a multi-touch controller and just all sorts of different hardware in there. Uh, in fact, I, I'm not sure about the iPhone 4, but uh, if you look at a typical, actually, do I have a slide on this? No. If you look at a typical, uh, if you look at the iPhone 3 and the 3GS, uh, the iPhone 3 is rumored to have 11 ARM processors in it <laughs> and an enormous amount of different special purpose hardware. And if you've written iPhone apps, what you mostly do is just turn on that part of the phone uh, 
that you want to use, use, and you turn off everything else. So you power gate it, right? So you, basically, your application just says, you know, this hardware is sort of for free. I'm just going to use the most power efficient hardware that I can and turn everything off. And I just sort of jump around from hardware to hardware to hardware, depending on what my app does. And so mostly what, what you have to do is you have to manage turning all these devices off and on. Uh, it's sort of a very different kind of programming model than we're used to, OK? But you know, they get extreme power efficiency with this. Like the iPad, you know, literally I can run the iPad all day, no problem, whereas the laptop itself uh, runs on a battery very, very quickly. So, so these processors are being built now, and you can go learn about them. So they already are these hybrid things. Um, so, they're, so they're heterogeneous. And you know, I mentioned almost all our supercomputers are turning into heterogeneous devices for this reason. Okay, so you probably noticed just two weeks ago, this Chinese supercomputer, Tianhe, Tianhe I guess, 1A, just became the number one ranked uh, supercomputer in the world. It's a combination of a Xeon processor plus a Tesla processor. And I've mentioned these existing machines. So we're getting this extreme heterogeneity in all levels of computing. So, so, so here's what typical people have to deal with. <laughs> so like I'm doing a lot of work in computational science. Let's say you're trying to write some code. Uh, you will very likely have all three of these machines in your laboratory. You'll have a, a traditional cluster, of a bunch of uh, CPUs connected over a LAN. Uh, you'll have a bunch of GPUs these days, OK? And you'll have, uh, you'll start also starting to see these multi-core SMPs really becoming popular again, these shared memory machines. And um, each one is sort of a fundamentally different architecture, right? So the cluster is probably the most widely known, but the GPUs are like SIMD machines. They often connected over PCI Express or like accelerators. They have separate local memory, separate GPU memory. They don't have virtual memory. Uh, on the multi-core SMPs, you're seeing incredible evolution in these things. You're getting more complex memory hierarchies with more levels in it. And one of the really interesting things, you're starting to see these chips with these really wide vector units now, uh, eight wide or 16 wide uh, vector units. And so, and then uh, along with all this hardware comes all these completely different programming models. And, and you know, not only do we have the various programming models we've used like MPI or threads and locks, but people are inventing them as fast as you can, you know, you, you can count, right? I mean, literally every grad student that I know in parallel computing is basically inventing a new programming model, uh, um, you know, <laughs> weekly. So they're just like this tremendous explosion of new programming models. And, you know, I, I have a lot of really good grad students. I don't have any students that can sort of fluidly program all these different machines uh, across these different different models. So this, so this is a real problem. I mean, this is really, I mean, I'm just trying to set up the problem. But the problem is machines are becoming really, really complicated and heterogeneous. And our programming models are becoming really diverse. How do we program such machines? OK, so that, that's really what our laboratory is trying to uh, think through. Now, there was a workshop um, on programming models recently, application program models. And the, actually, this was at Reno a couple weeks ago. And they, they came up with this sort of diagram of programming models, which I sort of liked, which is you can have programming models. And there's sort of three axes that you could imagine uh, evaluating them. One is sort of productivity, like how easy it is to use. One is sort of generality or completeness, like what problems you could solve with it. And the third is performance. How fast does it run? And you'd like to have a, you know, this unicorn programming language that just is this magical thing that just solves all your problems. But in reality, you usually only get a couple of these, right? So the standard way we, we work tends to work in a language like C or C++, where you get performance. It runs pretty fast, usually. And it's, we'd call this a made definition of uh, general purpose, complete. And then, but now you see, especially in the web world, incredible uh, amount of uh, stuff going on in this other axis where you sacrifice performance, right? It's not as nearly as fast to run Python or Ruby, but it sort of seems more productive, right? The number of lines of code is less. The IDEs and libraries are higher level. Uh, but you know, in this diagram, there's sort of this other space, right, which is, could you be sort of really productive, but also really perform well? 
And you might give up completeness for this, right? You'd say, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just, you know, maybe I can't solve every problem with this programming. I'd be more, let's just like the machines are more specialized, I'm going to specialize the application, right? And we think that there's, this is sort of where these domain specific languages uh, fit, okay? In that they're, they, they give up completeness. In other words, they're targeted for a particular domain, but they perform well and are really easy to use, okay? And so that's, so this is an area that we're interested in. We're particularly interested, of course, in, in making this work portably on different uh, machines like I was talking about. So one of the challenges, of course, I should just mention is complete, it's very hard to have a general purpose model that adapts well to all those different machines because each machine is based on a fundamentally different hardware abstraction. Okay, so I mean, yeah, you know, so now, you know, there, are, there might be other ways of doing this, but I have seen very few systems where people have taken these really general purpose things and run them the same code, and by that I mean the same code on these very different devices. Okay, so, so, okay, so that's the first part. So, I mean, that's sort of what we're proposing is a way of tackling this problem. Now, you know, just, I'll just say, uh, let me give you my definition of a domain specific language or library. It just, it ex it's something, it's a system that exploits domain knowledge to increase your productivity or efficiency. So, like, a great example is MATLAB, right? It, there's knowledge about matrices built in. You can use syntax of matrix algebra. R is another example, and statistics R S, very popular for doing data analysis. Uh, you know, database languages, uh, SQL, MapReduce, Link, are all uh, domain specific, higher level, short programs that do a lot. Um, I'll also claim a really good example of this is graphics where we think of OpenGL as a domain specific language. Now, what's sort of interesting is a lot of people when they build domain specific languages, they're sort of easy to use but really slow. <laughs> right, so MATLAB is sort of a, a, sort of a classic example of this. It's, MATLAB is pretty slow, right? You know, there's all these people in the world that do this prototyping in MATLAB and then they try to deploy it in production and it's just way too slow. R is another example of this actually been working on R lately, and R is really slow. Uh, even databases are remarkably slow. But what's interesting about graphics is graphics is really fast, <laughs> okay? You know, um, because, you know, it has to be fast. So, so sort of the interesting aspect of this and where parallelism comes in is can you make it really easy to use and run really, really fast? Okay, that's, that's sort of the, the, the trick here, okay? Um, so, okay, so let me just mention the graphics thing because I, I just want to make one other point about domain specific languages is that they don't have to be sort of standalone languages. They could be libraries and I'll come back to this. But if you, if you take an OpenGL program, this is a simple example, you, you set up the camera, you translate the scene to some position and then you draw a bunch of say triangles and then you finish the frame by calling swap buffers. You can actually think of that as a language. Right? You could actually write down a grammar for OpenGL where you would uh, say there's a camera and a world and the world, you know, the camera has a perspective and the world has a bunch of objects and objects have transforms and geometry and whatever. So even, you know, I just want to mention this point that, you know, a lot of libraries, because they have, they're stateful, right, that there's only certain ways you can call the procedures in the library and those constraints sort of define a language. So I've always thought that a graphics library is really a little mini language inside of a program that's controlling the GPU. So it's really, you know, what you're doing by writing this program is you're compiling that into the GPU and the GPU is running that program. And so the coprocessor executes these instructions, if you like, or interprets this program. Uh, so it just, so I just want to make this point, I'll come back to this, it, is these languages don't have to be separate languages, they can be sort of embedded, right? Um, uh, but anyways, this, so why is this so great in graphics? So this is how I got led to this. So I've been thinking about why this has worked so well in graphics over the years. And, you know, you look at this, the graphics library is easy to use. In fact, I teach intro to graphics and we teach it in one day. It, but it's extremely portable. It runs on a huge range of GPUs, okay? Uh, for example, if you've ever looked inside of a, 
AMD GPU versus NVIDIA GPU versus a PlayStation. They're completely different machines, and it just works. It just works. Um, um, the second thing is it actually does run extremely, extremely fast. In fact, if you implement OpenGL, uh, I, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but the, the sort of the compiler for OpenGL into the GPU exploits domain knowledge in radical ways to make this thing run extremely fast. Okay, for example, every time you send one of those vertices down, the, the semantics of the library is set up so that every vertex calculation is independent of every other vertex calculation. So that means you can have a big parallel array doing all those calculations and it will work properly. Um, there's very efficient uh, ways of doing the frame buffer. There's very efficient ways of implementing textures. Uh, and all these things uh, conspire to make it possible to, uh, this domain knowledge, I should say, the fact that this is graphics and not a general program, uh, makes it possible for these guys to map it to the hardware extremely efficiently. And therefore, you can really get these super optimized implementations. And I can tell you, if you were to just give me the raw NVIDIA hardware and try to ex build a graphics library on it, there'd be no way you could do it. It would just be an incredibly complicated thing because you'd have to program this really complex parallel machine. So it's all enabled by the fact that the semantics of this domain allows an automatic mapping into the hardware. So this is what's really important. And this is what has allowed graphics machines to be so innovative. OK, I'll claim. OK, this was really the epiphany to me. So in other words, if I look 10 years ago in what we had for graphics chips, they were incredibly simple and different than what we have now. OK, whereas you think of a normal processor, 10 years ago, it was pretty much exactly the same as what we have now. I mean, it's a little different, but it's not, compared to GPUs, it's, it's not very different. So what's happened is the vendors have been able to radically change the hardware to improve the performance of, of the GPU, OK? Because they're, again, they're programming at a high level. They can change the compiler. And if they change the compiler, they can change the architecture. Um, so, so, and as a result, they've actually been able to introduce all sorts of new programming models and abstractions, like CUDA, for example. So CUDA, it used to be that every stage in a graphics pipeline had a special purpose processor. With CUDA, they were able to show that all the processors could be the same. And so they could change the programming model uh, and realize the advantages of doing that. So anyways, these three things. So this encouraged innovation, I guess, is sort of just like forward portability. But I think if we... Uh, if this fact that we had this high-level API is what enabled all this. Um, and in fact, I'm actually sort of down on a lot of what's going on in GPUs right now because I think they're, they're, they're starting to have us program these things at a much lower level, and it's going to prevent us from moving forward because we're going to get locked into these legacy apps. So I think graphics could actually hurt, although other applications might not. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going through this whole argument somewhat systematically, but. Uh, I, I just feel people have underestimated the importance of, uh, of getting performance and encouraging innovation in the hardware as reasons for building these programming models. Huh? Okay, so, so, what I, so that's sort of the background. The main thing that I've been working on the last uh, year and a half or so is suppose you bought into this sort of notion, then could we apply this in a lot more domains? This idea. Could we build like sort of graphics libraries that would have all these, or, or things that are like graphics libraries, but in different domains and, um, and, and, and use them? Okay, so let me just, I'm gonna, the one that we're, we're probably doing this for three or four domains right now, but the one that's furthest along is a system called LIST, which is for programming PDEs on meshes. And we, we call it LIST because it's, it's supposed to make porting to these really complicated machines really easy, just like you know, List was sort of made playing the piano really, really easy. Okay, and this is a big collaboration with a bunch of people in mechanical engineering and aerospace. So, so this is meant to be like a concrete example of how you might build a domain-specific environment that run portably across a lot of different de devices. Um, so, particularly, what the problem we're working on is you know, how to simulate a scramjet. So, so a scramjet is, 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 a, is a jet that, normal jets have like turbo machinery and a combustor. A scramjet just has like a cavity and it's flying so fast at about Mach 7 that there's enough compression 
just due to the speed of the airflow to cause the fuel and the air to mix and combust without any turbo machinery. So turbo machinery basically compresses the air so that it can ignite. And it turns out the problem with these, these are, these are actually quite things. They're really simple to make. Uh, uh, they perform really well. But one of the big problems with them is they just shut down randomly. <laughs> the, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they get some turbulence in here. OK, they get some turbulence in here, and, and the engine stops. And they call that unstart, <laughs> unstart. So you're flying around at like Mach, Mach 7. And you're flying at Mach 7, and your engine shuts down. That's not good. OK? So, um, so, so you know, there's the specific scientific problem. And, and this is, nobody really knows why this happens. And so we're, they're trying to figure this out. This is like a you know, grand challenge kind of problem. Um, so then does it restart? Uh, well, it, well, what usually happens, first of all, they don't, they don't put people in these things right now. They usually crash. I mean, <laughs> I mean they know it's such a problem that most of the test flights, they launch them. It, it, it stops. And then you know, the, the, once it stops, they'll like, parachute it down so it doesn't cause damage or something. But yeah. And they, they, they do fly. In fact, this is an example of one called a high shot, which is actually been launched and has done unstart. So they're trying to figure out through these experiments like what's causing it, right? So so they don't you, you can't fly around in one now, they're not safe enough. And they try to prevent the damage from them. Um, but anyway, so they have to do this big fluid flow uh, calculation in this system. So it's a very typical thing. So this multi-physics, multi-scale flow calculation, mostly the most complicated thing is you're trying to model combustion in the presence of turbulence and shock waves. These are various experiments. You see here the shock waves you know, propagating down the chamber. This is the pressure spikes. This shows the predicted pressure. I mean, you can't see it, but there's the predicted pressure versus the experimental data that they got during this uh, flight, and so on. So there's a big, uh, big, big system. You know, it's like a couple hundred thousand lines of code that they use to do this simulation. OK, so when we started working with them, we said, all right, well, can you, I was, uh, first thing I always ask is, can you show me your code? <laughs> show me your code. OK, this is what they showed me. Um, you know, den this dense code that I guess if you were to summarize it in one word is it was rewritten from Fortran, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, but, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it's, so it's sort of interesting, right? I mean, and, and I've looked at a lot of these scientific codes. I mean, a lot of people did literally rewrite them from Fortran. But you know, it's really interesting stuff. Is that first of all, they just had array data structures, right? So you, that's one of the main evidences is you just see everything's an array, right? Uh, and it's sort of interesting. They store the mesh in the array, and they store what are called fields in the array. So this is a field of normals, and it has three components, x, y, and z. And they're, and they're actually computing a cross product here. And what's sort of interesting, but uh, and then they, you also see they have all these three vectors in here. What's sort of interesting is they never really thought that it might be wise to build like an object representing a vector, you know what I mean, and put it in a library. Uh, so they just inline all the calculations. So here they're subtracting two vectors, here they're taking the cross product of two vectors. Anyways. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they basically, this is very common code, I mean, that we see from this. And we spent a lot of time a couple years ago trying to get this to run on a couple machines. And we basically found that we had to completely rewrite it from scratch. In particular, the, 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 the most extreme example was going to a CPU or a GPU, where the way you laid out the meshes and the fields was completely different because of the way the memory hierarchy was arranged. In particular, you, there was this struct of arrays versus array of struct problems that some of you may have heard. You can either think of, you know, you can have like a collection of objects, each with all its variables, or you could think of having a collection of sort of columns with all the variables for each object. And if you did it one way or the other, it would run twice as fast or four times as fast. So, so the first thing they would often do is they would lay out all their data. And it turns out for one architecture, that would be a great way of doing it. But the, for the next machine, it would be exactly the wrong way of doing it. And so you know, our observation was that just there's no way we will ever take code lit, written at this level of abstraction 
and make it run on these machines. It just, there was just no way. I mean, you could say, oh, I'm going to completely rearrange all these arrays, but it, I mean, you know, nobody's been successful at that in the past, and we had no idea how to do it. I mean, we tried a couple things, uh, but you know, it just, it's, imp it's very, very difficult to rearrange all these data structures automatically by a compiler. Plus, it, it, was, it was a daunting task. So working with them, we divide, designed this language called list, which I'm showing you a fragment of, uh, where basically it tries to abstract everything about the data structures, like the meshes and the fields and so on. Now, just to, just to mention, this language is actually Scala. So uh, I mentioned that we're just embedding this language in another language. I'll come back to that. So this is just normal legal Scala code. It's nothing, uh, nothing actually unusual about it. But what we've done is we've defined all the objects in the interfaces so it looks like sort of a scripting language. In fact, when they first, they never, none of them had ever used Scala. They just thought it was like Python when they first saw it. It was just, and they're very used to Python. But anyways, you see some of the things in here. We have this mesh here, and we're iterating over all the cells of the mesh. Okay, if you want to compute the center of a cell, uh, we take the vertices of the cell. So cell.vertices is just a set of vertices associated with the cell. Then position is a, a, a what we call a field. So you see up above there, field. So a field is attached to a vertex and is a three vector. Okay, so, it's, so that's using a, a, a parametric type in Scala. Um, and when we index the field with the vertices, we get a set of positions. And then if we take the average, you know, just very simple, you know, functional, high-level description of what's going on, then we're looping over the faces, then we're looping over the edges of the face, you know, then here we're storing to a sparse matrix. So, you know, this code is just meant to be as clean as possible. I mean, we just spent literally, you know, a year designing this with them. Just saying, let's say you just want to write the code in a very clean way. Um, you know, how would you do it? And this is what we came up with. And there could be other ways of doing it. But okay, but notice there's no, you know, there's no specification of the details of the layout um, of the data structures here. And there's no specific parallelism in here, right? Everything is implicitly parallelized in some sense. Uh, so one thing we believe is you don't have to actually, you know, have to have explicit parallelism in these kind of DSLs, that you'll be able to recover the parallelism automatically. So those are the various things that's built into the language. I think I mentioned most of those. Now, the other, the, probably the, the other thing about it, which I'll just, uh, is important, is there's no explicit parallelism, but it's designed to be easy to parallelize. <laughs> And by the way, we thought this would be very controversial, but it wasn't controversial at all. Because most of these people had tried to parallelize various programs and realized how hard it was, that if you just sort of prevented them from doing, you know, you, they would sort of be aware of how they would get in trouble. So we just said, you know, here are some things that can really cause trouble for our compilers. Uh, for example, if, you're, if your loops, you know, actually have dependencies between different, iter different times through the loop, you know, then the compiler has to figure that out. So, you know, you're used to for all statements. We're just going to, let's make them all for all statements. Let's make them equivalent to a map. Um, uh, uh, there's no way of uh, cheating. And like, we, we always ask you to access the meshes and the data structures through these abstractions. So that means, as it turns out, we'll be able to analyze the access. Um, one thing we, we require is that if you use one of these fields, like position, that you only read it or only write it or only reduce it within a loop. So that, 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 and the compiler checks that or the language checks that. And again, we basically said, you know, if you start reading and writing something, then it's going to have to get synchronized and that's going to be a problem. You know? And again, we thought, you know, the, all the compiler people I know say, well, that's cheating, you know. Yeah, but of course it's cheating. But I mean, they're happy to do it because they know it never works, right? So they'll let you get away with that, okay? Um, and so on. And so the result, and I just mentioned this, the result is this that as a compiler can analyze the DSL automatically and it, can, it, has, the cap it has hooks to make it easy to parallelize, okay? Um, so this, this, is a, this is what a lot of DSLs don't do, okay? So for example, I mentioned I'm working on R. R never thought about any of these things and so R has all these issues 
um, because it hasn't thought about those. But so if you just sort of restrict the DSL, I think in fairly easy ways, you can make a lot of these operations almost trivial to do. So okay, so so now the question. So here's the here's the more interesting part. So now could we figure out how to take that program and map it onto parallel computers completely automatically? And uh, basically, yeah, we can, I'll show you how we can do that. Basically, the compiler knows about uh, topology of meshes, okay, uh, and about fields. And what that allows it to do is reason completely about how you're accessing you, the neighbors of any given cell. And so uh, it can do things like domain decomposition and, and so on, and uh, some of these other things I'll show you. But basically, it, because it knows about topology, it can analyze the code perfectly. Okay, so so let me just tell you. So like if you try to parallelize this program, and again they're running these on like hundred million elements. The first thing they want to do, they get this big mesh, and they got to parallelize it. They have to form some domain decomposition, right? So what they do is they say these particular cells will run on this processor, and some of these cells will be owned by this processor, these dark ones, and some will be neighbors, which they call ghost cells. And you just have to have access to the neighbors because we're going to be computing information flowing across a phase. And so you have, to, you have to be able to determine what neighbors you need to have access to and how to do this domain decomposition automatically. And this is sort of the bread and butter of a lot of these, these scientific codes, is doing this domain decomposition for arbitrary meshes. OK, so, so what do we do? So you have some program like this. Where what you do, the reason you have to access your neighbors is you're computing like flux. I mean, in, flux is sort of the canonical example, but you know you have some, say, temperature on both sides of that. One temperature in one tetrahedron, another temperature in another tetrahedron, and you need to compute the energy transport across that phase. And so you look at the difference between the two temperatures, and um, and this is a particular method that looks on the inside and the outside of the phase to compute this thing. So it does this for all the faces, and it computes this thing. Now, the key thing about this is we're only accessing, we're only accessing the mesh through these simple functions like mesh faces or f outside. And so and we basically can statically analyze these accesses. We can say all the cells you've accessed are some through some sequence of function calls, some functional sequence of calls. So it's mesh.faces.outside, mesh.faces.inside, and it's completely statically knowable. So we can figure out essentially what the stencil is. is. So what neighbors do you access? Now, I should just mention, a lot of times people do these things with integers where you'd have to like reason about integer calculations. By just using these access functions, we've made that completely symbolic, right? You're just accessing you know, these named access patterns. So you're not like adding, and you're not computing the outside index by adding some number to the inside index. You're computing it by just using this symbolic pattern, outside, inside. So that makes, that's what makes it possible to analyze this neighborhood. Um, so then what we can do is we, we can determine a partition, and it turns out if you only need one layer of ghost cells there, okay? Let me show you another example where you need two, and I'll show you, then I'll tell you how we did this. So now you just change your code. So here's an example of what they'll do, is they'll want to use what's called a higher order method, right? That depends on, say, four uh, cells instead of just two. So they'll have some new formula for computing the flux that has better convergence properties. They'll change their program in some way, and they'll want to use these four cells to compute that flux. But again, okay, you can look at it, it's still the same kind of static pattern of accesses. So you can, anal you can automatically determine that. And then when you do that, since you're looking at two cells, you'll find out that you need two layers of SCO cells in order to do that. Yeah? What is that picture showing? So, oh, this shows, sorry, thanks, I hope, sorry. This just shows this mesh, or not this one, but another mesh, partitioned. So what you're seeing is that I've actually divided these into two partitions, the green and the blue. And these are the cells that are, have to be shared between them so that the information is communicated across the partition. Yeah, is everybody following that? So, 
I mean, basically, I mean, the, the re they partition them. I mean, the basic argument for the partitioning, if you haven't seen that, is there's a surface to volume ratio that's important, right? The amount of communication depends on the surface area of the partition, and the uh, communication depends on the volume. So if you get a big enough partition with a small enough surface area, then you've reduced the communication to the point that, you know, it's not going to overwhelm you. And almost all these science codes use this because all the physics of all this is local, right? I mean, you can just access your neighbors here. Uh, I, I think the question was whether it came from some particular application. No, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can just show you this. So, so in, in the particular example, here's the, actually the example that we're running on. This is actually that vehicle. This is that vehicle I showed you, that high shot vehicle. This is the mesh from it. Okay, so what we actually do is just to just be specific about this, is this creates a graph of the mesh adjacency needed to run the algorithm. So it, it analyzes the code, it figures out this uh, graph of accesses, which is statically analyzed. Then this graph is given by, to a partitioning program, in this case Parmetis, which is a graph partitioning program, which is run, you can run it in parallel. And what that program then does is color these, these, uh, these regions. Okay, so the program uh, partitions the graph into these different regions. Uh, and the idea is that each of these has about the same amount of computation. So it does a graph cut algorithm, right? Uh, very standard way to do it. And then we now know we need to communicate across these regions, but by knowing the stencil size, we now know the ghost cell. Okay? So the key thing about this is this is completely automated. I mean, I mean, it's not that this is anything new, is it's completely automated for them. The scientist doesn't have to worry at all about this. Now, I, you know, this may seem simple, but I've gone to many, many labs doing these big simulation runs, and the mere idea that you could change your method from a first order method to a second order method like this, with, without having to rewrite all the ghost style code is, is sort of unbelievable to them. I mean, because what you'll do, like I've been at Los, Los Alamos a few weeks ago, literally they'll have whole codes organized by how many layers of ghost cells they'll have. So they'll have one branch of their computational science group doing one layer ghost cell codes, another branch of their computational science group doing two layer ghost cell codes. And um, if somebody decides to increase a method to higher order, like this simple, it just means you have to go to a completely different branch of software. Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually a pretty, pretty useful thing. So anyways, so all right, so now we've figured out how to optimally partition this thing for MPI, and you can run it. So here we're running it on a, a, a cluster of 96 nodes, and we get almost perfect uh, parallel speed up. Actually, and, and that, that's what the blue line, so red is, would just be ideal speed up. Blue is what we get with our program. Um, and then uh, this is actually uh, their program. <laughs> it's sort of interesting. When we started this project, they said, suppose you could do a DSL and you would only lose a factor of two. That would be great, right? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but we'll easily beat you. And they didn't believe us for a minute. But I mean, the guys writing this code doesn't know, don't, they're not MPI programming experts or whatever. So it was easy to beat them. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're computing it versus, well, the speed up is on one versus one core. Is that what you mean? Well, no, but you're using the same timing for. Yeah, yeah, same timing. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, they, they don't quite know why their code is so slow. I mean. <laughs> I think, I think what they're actually doing is they don't, they haven't figured, as far as we can tell, is they're actually synchron, over-synchronizing the ghost cells. What they've done is they've actually written the code to be more general, where they'll, they'll consider like two layers of ghost cells, and it's, the version we're running is actually simpler, and they can't remove the, so they're actually communicating more information across the boundaries than they need to, and just they wouldn't consider rewriting it because it's too hard to rewrite. That's, that's what we think is happening here. Um, so, and in this instance, we've actually got this to scale to like a factor of uh, almost a thousand nodes. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, I mean, I was pretty confident we could do it, but again, this is, this is um, pretty significant. Okay, but that just, so this is, the this is the classic productivity argument, right? You just, you, you, you sort of, you're convincing them, you're saying, wouldn't you rather, 
write your code like this rather than like that. <laughs> okay, but that's actually, you know, you'd think that would be convincing, but it's not. <laughs> Somewhat surprisingly. Um, but here's where you get them. Okay, sorry. You say, suppose you want to run the same code on a GPU. Now, if you start with that initial code, there's just no way. Just no way. But it turns out, with this list system, we can relatively easily run it on GPU. It only took us actually a few weeks to come up with a port. And, it, and, and not only that, what's interesting about it is the way you make it run on the GPU is completely different than the way you do it on MPI. Completely different. So if you try to run it on a GPU, actually, here's what turns out to be the hard part. In the case of MPI, the hard part is to partition it and to manage the ghost cells. In the case of the GPU, you're on a shared memory machine, and you have an incredible amount of bandwidth. So you don't need to partition it, and you don't have to worry about the ghost cells. But what you do have to worry about is code like this, where what you're doing is you're looping over all the edges, but you're scattering some information into two variables associated with the edge. So in this case, you know, think of the vertices. So you have an edge and there's two vertices on it, and maybe you're computing something that's flowing across the edge and you're adding it to each of the vertices. So you're doing this reduction into these uh, vertex variables like this. Now, you know, it's a very common piece of code. So what turns out on, you know, and this is well known when people used to build vector machines, and well known now people doing this on, on multi-core, is you have to lock these variables. Right, you have to lock these variables. So if you lock these variables on a GPU, GPUs don't do locks well. <laughs> Most, a lot of machines don't do locks well. I mean, they're not designed to do these locks at full speed. Right, so there's like hundreds of cycles of overhead to do this lock. Okay, so the way people have uh, tried to solve this problem is by a technique called coloring. Right, what you want to do is what you do is you consider, it, and this is what they would use on, on vector machines, is you would say, you would build, basically build up a graph of conflicts. You would say, these two threads are trying to write to this variable. If you could make sure they never ran at the same time, you'd never have to worry about this lock. So the same way that we determine like, what neighbors you're accessing, we can determine what neighbors you're writing to. So it's just a stencil. It's statically analyzable. So what we can do is build up a graphs of all the conflicts between all the threads. And, and I, oh, I should mention one thing. These graphs are on a per mesh basis. So we're actually, it's sort of a quasi runtime thing. It's it, when you start up the program, you read in your mesh, you build up the graph of conflicts. So it's not a completely, sta what, the, what the static analyzer does is tell you, essentially writes a program that tells the runtime how to analyze the graph. But the actual uh, graph depends on the mesh itself. Um, so, um, but anyways, it, when it reads in the mesh, it says these are the conflicts. And usually in these codes, they're very simple like this. And so what you can do is use this coloring technique, where you basically give threads different colors, either red or green. And the colors are, and you have to run this coloring algorithm to make sure that you never get any conflicts within a color. So this is relatively straightforward to do. And, um, but it's a completely different kind of optimization, and the way we generate the code is, I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you this is the most interesting thing, but the way you generate code for the GPU is completely different strategy than the way you would generate code for MPI. But because you have this high level knowledge about the accesses, it's easy to do, okay? So anyways, if you do this, and this, just summarizing this, huge speed ups. This actually is enough to attract their interest because if they were to imagine rewriting these programs, you know, I mean, as far as I've, I've been on a bunch of NSF panels lately, and it seems like, you know, there's literally a thousand grants given to people right now to rewrite, rewrite X in CUDA or rewrite X in OpenCL. I mean, everybody in the world's doing that, but it's like it involves a three year project with a bunch of grad students, you know. So, you know, um, it, it, it's a huge effort, and a lot of people, you have to be, you know, on the leading or bleeding edge, so to speak, to to try to do it. So this is just automatically. So this actually is, 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 is the killer thing for this. This is enough to convince them that, um, you know, that they should be using this kind of approach. Now, the other thing which we're working on now, we're very close to 
having finished is I mentioned the static, uh, I mean the SMPs with the vector units. So we, we have machines, these uh, machines with AVX and Larrabee native instructions. So these are just more traditional processors with uh, wide vectors. And uh, basically, uh, there's some different strategies involved in getting this code to run efficiently, but it's actually quite similar to the GPU. And now, uh, now we're able to just uh, remap to that. So we have some preliminary results on that, but I don't, I don't really want to show them yet. But you know, so we think that we'll be able to handle things like Larrabee and uh, uh, Bulldozer and Sandy Bridge uh, very, very soon. So now we'll be able to run the same program on an MPI cluster, um, you know, GPU or a SMP vector machine. Um, and of course, the next step is now I'd like to build all combinations of those. So, you know, sort of interest, so, you know, so that seems sort of doable. I mean, it's, it's, it's still sort of combinatorics there. So we don't really have a completely general strategy for doing this, but we're starting to see that by using domain knowledge, you can sort of, you know, um, adapt to the machine and use very different uh, strategies, and hopefully we'll generalize it into a couple that uh, work fairly nicely. Okay, so so that's the uh, that's about the result. Also, a sort of interesting thing we did is on a couple programs, and this this is on the, the program that they've been writing. Uh, we did some just sort of software metrics, which is sort of interesting. Uh, so their program is actually called Joe, and if you look at their code, it was written in mechanical engineering by a series of grad students. And if you, you count the lines of code, this is, this is a certain portion that we annotated. It's not the whole thing, but it's some of the more interesting thing, part of it. Um, um, the red part is sort of the, where, is the sort of interesting uh, research, <laughs> if you like, the flow solver. So in other words, one way they were seeing that is that's what they talk about at the site visits. <laughs> they say, you know, that's where we added value. That's what we did that was really interesting. Uh, that's what lets us do this calculation. But then they have this huge amount of gobbledygook code, which is a combination of libraries and parallel runtime. So this is like maintaining the mesh, or invoking a matrix solver, or dealing with MPI. If you actually refactor the code into this DSL, you still get about the same amount of code that actually does the physics. You see you have a, quite a bit of library stuff, which is shared, presumably between applications. In fact, it's shared between these two different implementations. And then you have the parallel runtime. And so you sort of get, I mean, part of it is just encouraging them to use good software engineering practices. But you reduce the number of lines of code dramatically, and you factor it in a much more maintainable way. And I, I, you know, I would, I've actually proposed to TOE and a couple other places that they actually study their programs, because I think if you, if you see what this right bar is, it's sort of a nightmare from a you know, maintenance point of view. And so you know, the left would obviously be much better. So it's, it's just interesting. So you know, there's more to be done about that. Um, OK. Geez, I'm almost out of time. All right, so uh, the last thing, I, I'm just going to really, I guess I'll have five more minutes. I'll just try to give you a little flavor of this. But, the, 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 the real, one of the real questions is how to create these domain-specific languages so that they can be ported. And you know, uh, when I grew up, when I used to hang out at Princeton and Bell Labs and whatever, you know, there was this big thing about little languages, right? Which I call, sort of call your roll-your-own approach, right? You had shell, make, aux, add, graph, sr. You know, people, you know, you know, Yak in some sense was invented <laughs> so people could build their own little languages. Um, and so a lot of people think of DSLs like that. Um, now, I've given this talk a couple times, and when people argue with me about it, which is common, is they, they really like to, they don't like this idea. They criticize it a lot. And here's the criticisms I get. So first of all, all these DSLs have different and somewhat arbitrary syntax. And this is really Linux. I mean, Unix's fault, right? I mean, you know, the shell, how many dollar signs do you put in, how many ways can you interpolate variables, you know, whatever. Um, you know, they're just all these random variations in syntax, and in general, you just have to learn all these languages, and, and it's just a pain. The other big problem is usually the languages are pretty poor. I mean, you know, uh, you know, and you can argue with some of the Unix languages; they're not the greatest languages. But you know, even things like SQL is just well known to be sort of a lousy language. I mean, it wasn't designed by people, and so uh, that causes problems. 
Uh, and you see this in a lot in the scripting languages as well, like Perl and, and JavaScript, where they just weren't really designed very carefully initially. One of the, but another big complaint is it's difficult to integrate with other libraries and languages. This is probably the number one complaint we've gotten, and one of the biggest challenges is you, you know, and MATLAB is a good example of that, where if you read the MATLAB blogs, they want complete object-oriented support for strings and text processing or whatever. Well, why should MATLAB have that? I mean, you know, it's not really what it was designed for. And in general, you know, there's this constant need to make these things more general. Fourth big complaint is where's the debugger, right? I mean, you know, you know, how do you do performance analysis? You know, if you build your own language, you don't, you just so conveniently forget to build a debugger for it or something like that. Um, and you know, they're finding things. It's actually really expensive to build these things. I mean, to build a complete language, so. So we think, I mean, you know, a lot of people have complained about this, but I, I just want to point out, and a lot of people have been working on this problem for years, is this really has led to this embedded DSL approach, which is what we're doing here, which is really how to make, like a, how to make a library act like a language. So that, I mean, that's what we've been thinking about the way of doing this. So you embed your DSL in an existing language so that, um, so you don't have to reinvent all the infrastructure of the existing language. And I actually think that pretty much addresses uh, the first four points. Not that there aren't any issues there, but you, using your existing syntax, it's, if it's a good base language, it's well designed. It obviously lets you interoperate with other libraries because you're using the other libraries. And hopefully you have a development environment. And it even addresses the last point is you, since you're leveraging the base language, you would um, so, um, so anyways, so I, don't, I don't have too much time, but the way we're doing this as a prototyping vehicle is we're actually using Scala. And a, and you could, and a lot of the, you could also be do, doing this in Haskell, I think, pretty easily. Those would be the, probably the two easiest languages to do it in. Um, but, you know, you know, the way we build DSLs is to define objects and types that define the domain and the methods define the semantics of the domain. And if the syntax is relatively clean, it starts looking pretty nice, like a language. So here's an example, a classic example of the matrix language. Um, and here's what I mean to say that your library acts like a compiler, is it, um, you know, or language, it has a clean syntax, but also that the compiler is very involved in doing all these things. So you have to be able to extend the compiler so that uh, you can do the analysis of the library calls. You have to generate low-level code for different platforms. You have to type check all the objects. Um, and what we're doing is, based in Scala, is what's called polymorphic embedding. So what you basically do is you define all your uh, languages as operations over abstract data types. So we'll say there's some abstract matrix. Um, so you actually haven't given an implementation of the matrix, you've just given an interface to the matrix which defines the language. So you, if you wanted to write a DSL, you'd say, I'm going to write a matrix program with my matrix language. And then the matrix language will define these abstract matrices. You might not call them abstract matrices, but I just want to point that out. And then you define your program. And then what you do is if you want a program to, be, to make a particular program, you uh, declare these abstract matrices to be particular matrices particular concrete implementations. So this would be like your normal built-in matrix, or this could be like an expression tree involving matrices. So you're polymorphic over those two representations. Uh, and then the challenge in doing this in a language like Scala is you have to be able to overload all your operations in your language. Or in Haskell, actually Haskell has the same problem. You have to be able to overload all your operations. And in Scala, there's this technique called implicits. So if you, if, you, um, if you have a type that needs to be cast to another type, there will be this implicit type conversion that can be in scope. So what we've done is we've extended these implicit type conversions to work on all the other basic primitives in the language. So the entire language can be abstracted away. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say we do it for everything. We don't do it for equals or class, but we actually do it for all the control constructs and including lambda because we have to be able to write functions in our language and analyze those. Uh, now you could just quote the code, uh, but then you wouldn't type check it. So we're, we're using this approach so we can type check the code. Uh, and then what we do is um, 
I'm just going over this very quickly, but we, we, we implement compilers by essentially augmenting the language with optimizing passes. So what we say is we have this matrix language, okay, but we're going to use the expression tree version of the matrix language, and we're going to use an optimizing expression tree thing that might do algebraic simplifications over the expression tree. And then if we want to bind particular types, we might say, oh, I want to make, I want to use the GPU implementation of matrices or the SMP implementation matrices. And, and then if I want to generate code in various ways, I'll just say with the CUDA compiler. So you're basically just augmenting, the way we actually do this is you just augment the object with all these traits, and the traits become passes, and the passes then do the analysis and generate the code. So what's nice is you haven't modified the compiler at all. All you've done is lifted the program up so that the uh, library can analyze it, and then you just have a series of objects with different methods that do different analysis. I realize I'm going through this very fast, but it's, um, it's actually a fairly, I mean, it's, it's just sort of a new take on this. Other people have done somewhat similar things. So we just wrote a paper on this. You might be interested in it. We've been working with this guy, Martin Orderski, on this, who uh, is the guy that's sort of behind uh, Scala. So just wrote a paper on that you can look at. So basically, the idea is to try to do this embedding approach and embed all these optimizations in the language without having to implement a new language. Just worry about the optimization. And so here, here's how we actually do it, but why don't I skip that. So I'll do, the final comment I'll just say is, so at the PPL, this is sort of our basic strategy is how we're going to tackle this problem. We, we're working with a bunch of different applications. We're actually developing a series of domain-specific languages. So I just told you about one, this list one. Then we embed that in Scala. Then we have all these low-level runtimes in Scala that do various things like task parallelism and data parallelism and scheduling. And I haven't talked about that. Uh, and then, then that generates code for different architectures. So we don't really have this diagram sort of working from top to bottom, but you know, we have it sort of working from here to above in, in a couple different application areas. So you can read some papers about. But it's just sort of our approach on how to handle all this complexity in the low-level hardware. Uh, I will mention this, this other language I'm working on, Random of T, is actually quite interesting. It's a very different kind of language. It's, its basic idea there is to take any variable and make it a random variable. So it's a probability distribution instead of a, um, a single value. So anyway, so just a summary. I mean, you know, we have this sort of huge issue in computer science right now is power efficiency is causing systems to get really complex. Um, you know, it's not clear to me how you would adapt a lot of general purpose systems, methodologies, languages, and stuff to deal with that complexity. You know, we think we could do it with DSL, so that's our least sort of bet on this. Um, you know, I showed you how LIST does it. You know, it's taking a particular approach for mapping to different platforms by exploiting domain knowledge. But I also mentioned, you know, that we, you know, we really believe this embedded DSL is the way to go in the future. And we actually need much better tools for actually doing that. 